Okay. Welcome on this, uh, what I think is uh, maybe a little bit cooler August day, as we, if you're like me, you're probably looking forward to maybe a month, six weeks from now, when it's a glorious time in North Carolina. Talk to some family in Phoenix over the weekend and take heart because uh, it was over 100 degrees still, of course, so way over 100 degrees. So. Uh, not a good time to be in Phoenix if you don't like really, really hot weather. But it's dry weather. But it's dry. That's right. Okay, so we know we've been concentrating. We've been concentrating on the Rio Olympics, of course, and all of the activities going on there. Any Major League Baseball fans in the room? Mary, Julie, I know, and Rick. Okay. Well, we got a little bit of a rivalry going on because my Los Angeles Dodgers are in this big time rivalry with the with Julie's San Francisco Giants. So we're coming down to that. So for those of you who like Major League Baseball, it is a very fun time of year. We're so glad to see you here. I'm Donna Martinez. Welcome to the John Locke Foundation, where we are fighting for your freedom today and ensuring your freedom for tomorrow. For those of you who are familiar with our mission here about freedom and opportunity, you will know that education and opportunity for every child, regardless of their socioeconomic status or their background or their location, uh, is important to us. We want to give every child the opportunity to really succeed in whatever they choose to do and to give their parents choices that really are fit them, fit that particular child's uh, needs and that family's wishes. And one of our, um, one of our uh, good friends here is our speaker today, former State Representative Marcus Brandon. In just a few moments, he's going to be talking about uh, public schools, about public charter schools, about different choices and where we are in North Carolina. I want to uh, first remind you that next Monday, August 29th, we hope you'll join us for Wake Forest Professor John Wood. He's going to be talking about examples of central banking in democracies. Really looking forward to, to that. Then on September 5th, which is Labor Day, we will be off. We will all be uh, with our families on that day. But we will be back on September 12th for a very special Shaftesbury presentation. We'll be uh, commemorating Constitution Day 2016. And our guest will be Professor John Diamond of Wake Forest oh. University. And he'll be talking about our foundational document, the U.S. Constitution, also the North Carolina Constitution, and he'll be putting it in a perspective also of what will happen um, after our elections this year, depending on who is uh, elected to particular offices and what their philosophy might be as it relates to the uh, federal and North Carolina Constitution. So we're looking forward to that on September 12th. Now, today, as I mentioned, education, you know, who doesn't think that that is important? Of course, each and every one of us believes that we want every child to be able to achieve and go on to live a happy and productive life. Where we have our policy discussions, of course, is about what is the best route to take in order to give a child and their families, their parents, those opportunities. One of the champions here in North Carolina for uh, improving public schools and creating more options is former State Representative Marcus Brandon. He now heads an organization called Carolina CAN. That stands for, I'll let you uh, tell us the, the actual acronym here. I can't have it written down. Here we go. The North Carolina Campaign for Achievement Now. And really, that tells you something, because that's uh, where uh, all of us, I think, can agree. We want more achievement for each and every child, regardless of their circumstances. He is a lifelong resident of Guilford County. He grew up there with uh, a family that was very involved in the civil rights movement. He says that that's where he learned the value of public service, and that really has helped him to guide him on his path through his life through today. He attended Southern Guilford High School at North Carolina A&T in Greensboro, and then he decided that he wanted to get into public service in elected office, and in fact, he served two terms as state representative in the North Carolina House of Representatives. It was there that he talked a lot about education and the relationship to poverty and lifting families and children out of poverty. And that's why we wanted him to come talk today about what's ahead for his organization and schools in North Carolina. Please welcome former state representative, Marcus Brandon. Thank you for the introduction, Donna. I have looked forward for this for a little while now. I was supposed to come earlier, and, and I got mixed up with the funder in New York, and I had to go there. 
as you guys know, you have to make sure the coffers are filled. And so um, it has been, it's an extreme pleasure to be here with, a, I consider a partner of uh, mine for a number of years. But when I was in the legislature, we were working very hard to make sure that we have outcomes for kids. And um, many of you know that I am a Democrat, and so I had to fight that battle um, a, a lot, uh, and, and, and a lot more differently than I ever expected, but it was um, a battle worth fighting. Uh, when you're talking about kids, and I appreciate the uh, I appreciate the uh, introduction, but I will start with just a little bit about me. I am a resident of um, of Gilbert County, and um, my parents. Um, I am a descendant of the civil rights movement. Ever since I could walk, I have been knocking on doors and passing out flyers, and it never dawned on me that I would do anything other than just that. Uh, but my parents taught me in a year early age about equal opportunity and equal access. And I do believe that my fight in education goes along with that, those values that I taught was taught when I was younger. But what happened was is that when I ran for office, I was the typical Democrat. I was the one that, I was a fundraiser in, in campaigns. And so the first place I took my candidates when I, they were running for office was the teachers union. And that's the first place you go. I never knew anything different, and, um, and that I was a Democrat, and that, that's the way it went. And so it wasn't until I ran for office that I actually looked at um, my neighborhood and my communities that I was representing. Someone told me, Marcus, you know that the represent that you want, that the, the district that you want to represent has the poorest zip code in the entire state. And so I moved there. And that's in High Point, and it's 27260, and I moved there right in the middle. And you could ask my mother who cried and wanted me not to live there. And uh, because I didn't have, I don't ha I'm not fortunate enough or unfortunate enough to have the story that I um, grew up in poverty and made it out so I knew what that was like. I don't have that. My parents worked very hard, both college graduates. And so they shielded us from a lot of that. So when I knew that I was going to represent that, I had to figure out what that looked like. And so. Um, I moved to the neighborhood, and what I found out was it wasn't just a few people, like in the school that I went to, that didn't make it out of high school. It was mostly everybody, and um, and I never understood what, I, I just never fathomed that. And so when I was looking at, and I asked all of my interns, anybody that comes works for my campaign, we were going to knock on doors, and I always asked them to ask the question so they could be just as flabbergasted as I was that it was not just a few, it was the majority that did not have a high school diploma. And then once they learned that they didn't have a high school diploma, I understood that that meant that, that, that they were going to get a felony. And they were like, hey, Representative Brandon, can you get me a job? I certainly cannot. I cannot get you a job if you don't have a high school diploma and you, don't have, and you have a felony on your record. And that's where I learned, where right down the street from my house, two doors down, there was a liquor house. And, um, and that's when I learned what a liquor house was. I, I always thought it was something totally different than what it was. And then, um, and then I understood what, why things were the way they were. They didn't have the opportunity, to, like you and I, to go put in an application and look for jobs the way most people do. That's not what happens there. And so their life is about survival. And so it's about money immediately. It's about how am I gonna put food on the table at 5.30 to make sure that me and my kids eat. And none of the things that we talk about and none of the things that we speculate on and the things that are even a you know, reality in their world. It's, it's like almost the whole sub-world that, that they, they live in. That's where you see the crime. That's where you see the poverty. That's where you see all of these things that they do to be able to create economics in their communities because they can't work. And um, just because of the way the system is. And we all know that and those are different topics, but it all roots around this education. So I fought. When I came, I said, I'm not going to do the same thing. I knew that the school right down the street had been failing kids for 27 consecutive years. And that means a lot whenever you're looking at it's people say, oh, Marcus, we can just, you know, I hear the fantasy from the other side. And, you know, like if we just invest more, if we just do this more, if we do this more. But we all understand that those are not all necessarily things that get our kids moving. And so that's the really the reason why I wanted to come talk to you, because we have politics, we have poverty, and then we got to deal with our participation. But I'll let you know just a little bit about Carolina Can. I'm very proud executive director. We agitate for high quality education, regardless of everybody's zip code, uh, which is, goes along with your mission around education. And um, we have um, 
Our three-year vision is to make significant strides toward expanding existing choice programs, because um, I do believe North Carolina is one of the best in the country in the, in, in the way that we uh, have in, in, uh, been innovative and the way we deal with choice. Um, encouraging great community involvement in education reform and improving access to high quality education for low income families and, North, and ensure North Carolina students are graduates. Students graduate college and career ready and that's very important because we do have an increased graduation rate across the state but our college and career ready numbers are still dismal and that means a lot. That means a whole lot uh, when it turns to uh, people ready to move on to the next phase in their life. And I would like to say that that number of ecology career ready goes beyond socioeconomics. All of our kids are affected by that number, every single one of them, all demographics. And um, But our the goals that we put out this year, I think that we um, are, we, we accomplished them. Uh, most of them, uh, except one, expanding opportunity scholarships. I was very proud to work with my partner, uh, Daryl Allison, with uh, Parents for Educational Freedom to make sure that we, this was my baby bill, this is the bill that almost got me hung and killed. And so, and so, and so, um, so, the, so the voucher bill was it's actually uh, solidified in the state of North Carolina, I consider. Uh, we put a fund around it, we expanded that opportunity to include about 25,000 more kids. And what that really means is that we don't really have to come back to the General Assembly every single year and begging for that money, that, that this money is gonna be there and we can continue to expand uh, this opportunity to, to low-income kids all across the state for a number for at least 10 years and I think that pretty much solidifies that and that's a big victory for me personally and a big victory for the state of North Carolina. An established and achievement school district. Another thing that almost got me hung um, as a Democrat, but this is a very important bill. We were very much a part of this particular bill that worked at the forefront our organization uh, produced legislation. Uh, we worked re really hard with Representative Bryan uh, to make sure that this became a reality. Why achievement school districts are important and we're getting ready to go to the implementation is that it wasn't necessarily that I had a lot of data that said that this was going to be the big fix for everything. We're only dealing really with five schools. But what we did do is, is that we made sure that in this state that we now have a mechanism that says that we no longer allow students and, and school districts to fail kids for 20, 25 consecutive years. It's the ultimate accountability. And we talk a lot about accountability in the state of North Carolina. And, we, and, and, and especially as a person that promotes charter schools and has, uh, I'm on the board of a charter school founding board member. People always like to throw the accountability argument back to us, but I always tell people that we can get shut down. If, 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 if a charter school does not perform well, and a charter school is not meeting expectations, the state of North Carolina has and will shut us down. The ultimate accountability here is, is that you have public schools that have been failing for 20, 25 years, and nothing happened. All, all 700 kids will go to that school next August regardless. So just because you have accountability measures doesn't mean that people are being held accountable. And so this bill actually allows us to do that. And so what, what, and I'm very proud of the bill because if the best thing that comes out of this bill is that I always tell people, they say it's a little arrogant, but it's true. If you don't want to become an achievement school district, now you can begin the conversations not to become one. And I think that's the best part of this bill that, uh, that students and, 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 and teachers and, 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 and stakeholders all across the state will now be having a discussion about not how to get there, and that's a plus um, for the state of North Carolina. And I'm excited about achievement school districts, and we'll go into more about how we can make those more successful. Um, the other one is equitable funding for charter schools. We do have in the state of North Carolina uh, a, 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 a dichotomy where public school students and traditional public school students are receiving more than, um, than students that are in, in charter schools. I believe that is a civil rights issue and an issue that we must deal with because how can you say this public school student gets $8,400 and this one does not? And how do we say that this charter school doesn't uh, meet these, uh, meet the same criteria? I know that in my charter school, I spend about $560,000 a year on transportation. So all of these myths that you hear about, oh, they don't provide transportation, and, they don't, and we everybody gets a lunch. And this is the, this is true for most of our uh, most of most of the charter schools 
that deal with Title I funding or deal with uh, kids that are 125% uh, of poverty, we've got two hands tied behind our back, of not only in, in equitable funding, but I want you guys to think about this in just the way we deal with education, period. Um, a charter school, my charter school, we mostly get all of our kids from Guilford County Schools. Most of them are three, four years behind in proficiency. But the, public, the, the policy is, is that if I don't have them up to proficiency within a year or two, then I get a D or F and, um, on my report card. And the goal is for us is to be able to take those kids that are struggling. So we have some policy issues to deal with on the charter side that we've got to be able to make it sure that it's equitable and make sure that I, I that I that every kid that comes through my door I have an opportunity to be able to make them successful without being penalized. And so those are the things that we are fighting for at Carolina Can. We're going to be fighting for more initiatives. But those are the things that we did with 2016. We accomplished two out of three. The last one we almost got there passed the House and the Senate and got stalled in the in conference committee. And I'll stop talking about that so we can have a pleasant more time. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, but this is what keeps me up at night, and what I wanted to kind of have a discussion with you guys, and it is a discussion, is that given the existing funding paradigm, how can we leverage stakeholders at the local level to maximize capacity in meeting North Carolina's families and students' needs? And so what do I mean by that? What I'm saying here is this. The truth is North Carolina is eight in what we produce financially for the state, uh, for our public schools. You hear the, the term 45th, 49th um, um, thrown out there in per pupil spending and teachers, uh, teacher pay, but that's not the truth in terms of what the state legislature puts out. For example, the, uh, for example in Connecticut, their state legislature pays their teachers $28,000 a year. We far exceed that in the state of North Carolina, what we pay our teachers. What you don't see, in, because we decided 100 years ago that we wanted little Anson County to look like Guilford County, and we wanted that to be equitable, and it was a great thought process. But as you see, as time has gone on, and has, as, as, as more innovation has gotten in it, and, and we have more families and more diverse needs, that's almost an impossible task for the state to handle it by itself. And I let people know that not only we're we doing this for Manny to Murphy for every public school, we have 57 community college that we have to pay for every building and every teacher and every cafeteria worker in there. And we have 17 public universities that we pay for every building and every professor and every cafeteria worker in there. And so when you do that also for public schools, you have a huge, huge amount of money that's being spent on public education. I, for one, am very proud of what our state legislature does for North Carolina public schools, regardless whether it was Republican or Democrat, all both governors and, and, and majority leaders and have faced the same exact issues. And we, you can see it, it doesn't matter when the Republicans were in charge, we had the same fight, and when Democrats were in charge, we had the same fight because we have a reality in North Carolina about how we fund. And so I am not here to advocate for more taxes. I am not here to advocate for giving people more uh, taxing authority. What I am here to say is, is that we have examples of great public-private partnerships that we can engage in to increase the capacity of local participation. Because we have advocated and we have a culture that has advocated the responsibility solely to the state, you have now seen that culture evolve from the point in the 70s, where in the 80s, where we had 85 to 90 percent PTA participation rate. We've seen that dwindle down all the way to 5, 10 percent participation. We've seen local stakeholders, cities who don't even have a budget at all to deal with education, not one iota, and they've advocated that responsibility to the state. And so, um, what you have is a huge vacuum in Connecticut. Their state pays 28,000, their LEA pays 10, their county pays 10, their city pays 10, and that's how people can make $70,000 a year. Here, we might have supplements in some of our richer counties that will supplement um, our teachers, but pretty much the majority of our folks are left with what the state gives them for pay, and that's the end of it. And so that's not really the case all across the country. So we have this reality that we really got to deal with <coughs> and in terms of that. So how do we do it? And that's why. We're going to have a discussion because there's a lot of ways that we can do it, and I'm not an expert on it. But I would love your input in, in terms of like how do we, what you think the space is. And when I say space, I believe everybody has a space. 
And we have examples like Project Lift in Charlotte or Yes Guilford in, in, in Guilford County where you've seen the private sector meet with the local government to be able to create capacity around a certain goal. And Yes Guilford, we could argue whether the goal was meaningful or not. But we, but but it was, it, but 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 it was people that came together and said, "Hey, private sector, we need X amount of million dollars." And the 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 the, the county commissioners and came together and said, "Okay, we're going to match that, and we're going to make sure that all kids go attend college, whatever that means." And so, but they did it, and so and so they created that capacity. And Project Lift, uh, me and um, now Senator Tillis worked really hard to be able to create create the environment or, or create uh, new laws that we can have a public-private partnership where the business community came together there and they decided that we were going to take care of a certain segment of Charlotte that was just dismal in performance and created something like an I-Zone, almost like an achievement <coughs> school district where we brought in um, great Teach for America folks, we extended school days, we dealt with parental involvement, infused a lot of money in there, extended uh, a lot of things, and you saw numbers jump 30, 35 spots, um, points, in their performance because we engaged in that public-private partnership that's still continuing today. So it is my belief that, um, that since the state of North Carolina has created the environment that we are a top-heavy state in what we deal with in education. It is incumbent upon our state to be able to, to change that culture and change that mindset. So that's why I really believe that public-private partnerships is on the way to go. How do we incentivize that? Can we take existing money that we have that are geared for why kids don't come to school ready to learn, or the wraparound services, the, uh, the English as second language, all of these monies that we have in our state coffers. And I can tell you, there's about 80 million or more dollars there um, that somehow goes elsewhere. Um, but but, uh, but there, there, there is enough funding there. But I, it's just an idea in terms of like, how do we be able to, how we're gonna be able to create that capacity. And there is a capacity issue that we have in the state of North Carolina. And I, uh, I will open it up and leave it there to see if anybody has any questions about that proposal. But like, that's where I'm at with it. We have great policies, and I was telling on the radio show, policies that do anything. As a former person that made policy and has been doing this my life, you can make policy. The policy creates access for people. And so, I, for example, I have one charter school policy. I have great charter schools, and I have not so great charter schools. They're all under the same policy. It's people that make those charter schools work and make those charter schools successful. And then it's the same thing with ASD and achievement. It's going to be people, yes. Um, in the current funding, um, the state funds basically the, the teacher salaries, correct? Right. And then are there some, in the past I think there were, I'm not sure now, are there barriers to what a locality can put into the school system? Are there barriers about the monies that they can put in? Or are they able to put in whatever monies they have? There are barriers if it's not like local, uh, local uh, the LEA's number one has a barrier they can't create their own tax system. That's okay. one barrier. The other thing is, is that county commissioners only have the solely responsibility of dealing with facilities. And if they do any type of funding mechanism, it can only be around that. The other barrier is, is that money that comes in is not necessarily controlled by the county commissioners or the LEAs how that gets spent. We've been working on that in the General Assembly um, to deal with that particular issue to give them a little bit more flexibility about how they can maneuver money to keep teachers or to do programs that they want. But they don't necessarily have full autonomy over them. What I find is we, we focus a lot on funding, but we focus not enough on what I call content. Uh, I don't know if the kids today have the quality of content their parents had. We throw all this stuff out there. We get no child left behind. We get raised to the top, never tested in any state, but nationally mandated. Now the poor teacher has to deal with this stuff 